All right. You got your Bibles. Turn to John, uh, Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Appreciate your prayers for my family. We all have uh, faced the flu. And I thought I was getting over it this morning. Then today I started losing my voice. So my wife is absolutely devastated. I hate that you laughed at that, but okay. We come to Jonah chapter 3, and we see the results of Jonah's preaching. We talked about his message last time, and what tremendous results that we see in, uh, from Jonah's preaching here. Everyone made a decision. The king made a decision. The subjects of the kingdom made a decision. And then most interestingly from that, God made a decision. Now, we're going to talk about God's decision next week. But uh, the decision for all three of these was to repent. And uh, we don't, again, not to ruin next week's, but we don't often look at God repenting, but the Bible says here in verse 10, God repented. So we're going to talk about that uh, coming. But first, the king repented and the subjects repented. Now, let's start reading here at verse number 5 of chapter 3. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came into the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Father, I pray you'd help us tonight as we look at this passage and learn some things even from this wicked city, Nineveh, who did the right thing at the time. We pray you bless now in Jesus' name, amen. So first uh, decision that we see tonight was the subjects. The subjects of Nineveh made a decision. The response of these citizens was uh, found in verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest even to the least. The people of Nineveh did not rebel against the message. They did the one thing they needed to do after hearing it and they repented. Now, wouldn't it be something if every nation responded this way to the preaching of the word of God, repenting. Uh, Nineveh had 40 days before her destruction, but because she repented, she added 150 years to her life. Nothing benefits a nation like getting right with God. Nothing benefits a nation like righteousness. The Bible says righteousness exalteth the nation. And so we see that even here. Look at the promptness, though. They did not delay at all. Uh, as soon as Jonah declared Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It says they believe God. Then they put that belief into action and they repented. Delay in action always invites more trouble for delaying in repentance anyway. The Bible always uh, encourages immediate and prompt repentance of uh, our sin and, of course, also for salvation. The Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You only prolong the problems and dangers to your soul if you put off repenting. We never know how much time we have left. So when God calls us to repentance, we ought to be immediate in that repentance. Then look at the prerequisite of the repentance. The, the people of Nineveh believe God. Now this had to happen for them to repent. To believe God, of course, is to believe his word. Jonah preached God's word. Nineveh believed it. Faith is the foundation of repentance. The Ninevites were not just hypocrites. They weren't just fasting and put on a sackcloth for show. It was from the heart. Why? Because they believed God. And this belief of what, in what they heard, the word of God, is what resulted in them repenting. And really, isn't that our need today? The believing God. I mean, for people to recognize the word of God and believe what God says. We need to believe him about sin and salvation, about right and wrong, about good and evil. We have deluded ourselves as a nation and as a generation 
with fairy tales. And even as Christians, we allow those fairy tales sometimes to get into our, uh, into our lives. We accept the psychologists and the humanistic views of the world. We ignore the most important truth of all, which is the Word of God. No wonder we have such strange and sinful thinking and behavior in our world today. I mean, just uh, look around, the things that we're facing that we'd have never thought we'd have to face before. It's interesting to me sometimes when I'm going through commentaries and they'll talk about this, the state of the world and the things that are going on and the, the big problems, the big sin problems. And if they were written in the 90s or the 80s, older commentaries, I almost wish for those problems anymore. I mean, we can't figure out which bathroom to go into today. I mean, we got, it's just de de degrading and degrading and degrading. Why? Because we've departed from the Word of God. We've followed humanistic thinking. Until we believe God, we cannot please Him. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. But, and then also the prevalence of their repentance. This is amazing. Everyone repented in Nineveh. From the greatest, verse 5, of them, even to the least of them. Now, never in recorded history has there ever been so many decisions in such a short time from the preaching of one man in one place. This is incredible. I mean, just think about it. Pentecost was a drop in the bucket to what Jonah saw that day. The greatest miracle in the book of Jonah, I remind you, is not the fish. The greatest miracle is this revival that took place in Nineveh. Now, I'd like to point something out just from the perspective of a preacher. We just came back from a conference this last week. And today, Jonah would be invited to speak at every conference that, would have, that, that could get him. I mean, if there was a gathering of preachers... After that revival, Jonah would be called on. There would be videos made. There would be books written there, uh, the, about Jonah and his success because of what a tremendous revival he saw. But can I remind you, there was another man named Noah. He preached for 120 years, did not see one convert. So I ask you, was Noah a failure and Jonah a success? A thousand times, no. Jonah did what God told him to do. Noah also did what God told him to do. And we generally judge a preacher or the success of a ministry by the number of decisions. And we all want to see decisions. We all want to see people saved and baptized and added to the church. But a lot of times we make the mistake of thinking someone with a lot of decisions or a big ministry is a good preacher and those with few decisions or a smaller ministry is a bad preacher. That's not what determines your success. Faithfulness is what determines your success. I heard about one preacher who asked his wife, how many really, truly great preachers do you think there are in the world? His wife said, I don't know, but I suppose there's one less than you think there is. Um, wives are always really honest, aren't they? Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the other prophets in the Bible, they didn't experience the success that Jonah did. Did this make them... Uh, by the way, a lot of them were persecuted greatly by the people they were ministering to. Does this mean they were inferior to Jonah? Not at all. But that's why we need to be careful how we judge ourselves today. We don't only judge ourselves by the world's standards, but faithfulness to God. A man may faithfully preach the word of God and never see a Pentecost or a Nineveh. But what vindicates a ministry is not only decisions, but faithfulness to the word. And so... Uh, I, and I believe personally that if we are faithful to the word, the decisions will follow. And so that's my goal here. And then the practice of repentance. It's a common practice in the Old Testament to show sincerity and, uh, their, in, in, by fasting and sackcloth. We see that all throughout the Old Testament. So when the Ninevites, it says they believed God and they repented, they proclaimed a fast, verse 5, and put on sackcloth. The principle to fasting is to abstain from something to allow the pers pursuit of spiritual matters. The spirit of fasting is not seen in our day so much, probably as it should be. And I say that to our shame, my shame as well. I, I, I don't, I'm not faithful in fasting like I should be. I did, I fasted quite a bit the past few days, but there was other reasons for that. <laughs> but uh, uh, we probably should do more of it. 
uh, but instead of giving up something carnal to pursue the spiritual, we're more likely today to give up something spiritual to pursue the carnal. And that's what fasting's all about, is to give up something not necessarily bad, like food or whatever it is, uh, to give it up for a season so that you can pursue the spiritual. And we ought to be uh, about that as well. The promoter of their repentance. In the New Testament, Jesus said, this is interesting, in, in Luke 11.30, that Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites. You ever read that verse before? What, that, what does that mean? Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. I think, that's a little new perspective that I've come across this week, but I think that for Jonah to have be a sign to the Ninevites, they had to be somewhat aware of his history, which is not surprising uh, for them to know about his disobedience, about his flight, about his getting on the ship, about his being thrown off. Uh, probably it was known about him when he arrived in Nineveh. Otherwise, it would have been sensationalism if he would have try to spread it all himself. And it's not difficult, it's actually pretty logical to assume these sailors would be all about telling the story when they got back to land. And then, uh, after they talked about what happened to Jonah, and then for him to show back up on land, that story would spread like wildfire. And of course, uh, the, uh, the, the story would circulate. Uh, Nineveh had many traders and merchants throughout the world. It wouldn't take long for the story to come back. So I believe when Jonah arrived in Nineveh, Nineveh probably knew all about him, and that's uh, that knowledge would make Jonah a sign to the Ninevites. He would be a representation of God's judgment on disobedience, but he would also represent God's grace uh, to preserve the guilty from judgment when they repent. Like Jonah, when he repented, God preserved him from judgment. Look also at the praise of their repentance. Nineveh's repentance is praised by Jesus because they took advantage of their spiritual opportunities. In Luke 11.32, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Nineveh's opportunities were not near as great as the people in Jesus' day. They had the Messiah preaching to them. Jonah did not provide Nineveh with near the light that Jesus did. Jesus did miracles. He did signs. He did wonders. Yet the people of Nineveh repented, while the people of Jesus' day did not. And Jesus said that Nineveh will judge. The, 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 the fact that Nineveh got right with God is a judgment on this generation. And I think we can add that to our generation as well. Because his praise of Nineveh is also rebuked to us. How great are our spiritual advantages today? Everybody that has a cell phone has umpteen Bible apps they can download, have it read to them in any language, any modern language pretty much. There is no reason for anyone not to have the Word of God at their fingertips. Uh, we, we live in a still, somewhat, a Christian nation, and there's just very little excuse for folks in our generation not to repent. And uh, things are spelled out so plainly today we have the entire Bible. All Nineveh had was, Ju was Jonah's sermon. We have a host of miracles in the New Testament to prove who Jesus was and his messages. The, uh, and then, of course, we have the resurrection uh, that, uh, of Jesus Christ. Nineveh only had Jonah. What a huge difference. And yet, uh, Nineveh repented, while many that have our advantages do not. And that is uh, certainly a uh, rebuke on us. I want to look at the king, though. So we had the subjects made their decision. Look at the king. Uh, verse 6. <coughs> For word came into the king of Nineveh that he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Now later he's going to send out a decree for Nineveh to repent. But I think it's right and proper that he himself first is right with God. This is a good pattern. Before we can do anything about others getting right with God, we've got to be right with God. So the, uh, before we preach to others, we might make sure we apply the message ourselves. So the king took two significant actions here. He changed where he sat and he changed what he wore. Notice what it says, where he sat, first of all. But the message here, so moved the king, he arose from his throne and sat in ashes. 
Now, for the king to sit in ashes is a pretty great thing. He gave up his seat on a royal throne to do so. For his subjects to sit in ashes, they might mean moving from a dirt floor to moving to ashes, but he left a royal throne to sit in ashes. He demonstrated great humility there, which is important in repentance. His action also proclaims the truth that no matter how important your position is in life, that does not mean anything before God. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. God is not a respecter of persons. And so we all come the same way. What gives us position with God is our spiritual condition, not our uh, earthly con uh, position. What he wore, also he changed. This is interesting. The king laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth. Now, the king's robe was something to behold. W.J. Dean puts it this way, the magnificence, mag, blah, the wonder <laughs> of the Assyrian king's attire is attested by the monuments. Uh, but he was willing to lay aside this glorious robe to repent and put on sackcloth. The word robe in our text is interesting. I love these little connections in the Bible. Uh, it's the same ro uh, word translated to Babylonian garment in Joshua 7.21. So there you have one of God's people coveting Achan, coveting this Babylonian garment, and giving up what he had to get it, ended up dying for it. And here you have a king of a nation, a wicked nation, who lays it aside without any hesitation uh, to come to the Lord. Isn't that something? What, a, what an amazing contrast that is. Here you have a wicked king, and that Babylonian garment meant nothing to him. How sad it is when God's people are longing and coveting after the things of the world that need to be given up in repentance anyway. Look at the statute, verse number 7 and 8. He took action here, caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh. Uh, he had never made a better decree than this one, called on Nineveh to repentance. No law helped the city as much as this one did. Now I want to look at, uh, just break down the statute. It covered four areas. I'm racing my voice because it's about to stop, so we'll just, we'll get to the end here real quick. They're animals. Nineveh had much cattle, according to chapter 4, verse 11. And the decree of the king included these animals, that they were not to taste anything, neither let them feed nor drink water. Also, they were supposed to put sackcloth on the animals. Why were the animals involved in the decree? Probably so that everyone's attention could be lasered in on repentance. This would help keep people's mind on what was important here. Without water, the animals would be bellowing all day long, nonstop reminder to people of the morning of repentance. That was what was going on. There's a great principle about spiritual pursuits here. That anything you approach halfway is not good enough. If we really want to benefit from the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God like they did here, we're going we're gonna to go after it all the way with, our, with all of our heart. Half-hearted service to God is seldom worth much. Not only their animals, but their attire. Verse 8, they should be covered with sackcloth. This is the third mention of sackcloth for the inhabitants of Nineveh. Our attitude towards God and God's ways will be seen in our attire, the way that we carry ourselves, the way that we dress, the way that we present ourselves, not only in our clothing, but uh, our smile, our countenance, the way that we are as Christians. Uh, this, this, Nineveh went great lengths to show their repentant attitude towards evil. They changed all these things. And then their appeal. The decree called the people to prayer. Verse 8, cry mightily unto God. The statute demanded the people to pray earnestly, which is the only effective way to prayer. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5.16. Right praying is not always easy. It requires effort. We ought to pray fervently. So their animals, their attire, their appeal, then their actions. <coughs> the decree ordered them to turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Reformation of conduct 
was a vital part of this decree. It is the evil conduct of the people that brought on the judgment or the promise of judgment. They could wear sackcloth for weeks. They could fast until they dropped. But if nothing changed in their life or their heart, it would be useless. So a change in conduct, a change, a repentance in their lifestyle and their actions, this is what showed the sincerity of the sackcloth and the fasting and the praying. True evidence of our faith is how we live. It's found in the way that we live our lives. We can say anything we want to, but how we live is the, is uh, going to be the true nature of it. The decree of the king of Nineveh was outstanding. And again, what a rebuke it was to Jonah, his own national leaders. What a rebuke it is to our nation as well. And as Jesus said to the, time, the people in his time as well, that we would have this type of quick response to conviction of the word of God the way Nineveh did. So imagine these many thousand years later that we're using a wicked, wicked place like Nineveh as an example to righteousness. But it is because they responded correctly to the word of God. They repented and they did the right thing. Now, next week, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about God repenting. That's going to be the interesting one, so you don't want to miss that. Thank you for your patience with voice tonight. So hopefully it'll all be back by Sunday. And uh, we're excited about what the Lord has for us then. Don't forget, we have our uh, meal on Sunday, our, uh, our uh, uh, fellowship dinner, and then we also have our 